Well, good evening, everybody. How's it going? Hope you're having a, a great Friday evening. Hope the uh, the week's been better for you than last week, which was a bit miserable outside, but miserable weather-wise where we were, certainly. Who have we got in the chat this evening? We've got Pilsnerish. Hey, good to see you. Hope you're going to have fun with your TBM flight as well. And uh, Amy, how's it going? Good to see you again. I'm going to have to make you guys VIPs, I think, uh, always showing up in the chat. To anybody else in the chat that uh, is keen on flying the TBM, come and say hello. What we're going to do is fly the aircraft from Biggin Hill in the southeast of England up towards uh, Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. And uh, if we've got some time at the end of the stream as well, we'll do some uh, general aviation flying as well. Just a little bit of fun, maybe for half an hour or so on the end. All right. 8 degrees, 9 degrees, minus 9 degrees and snowing. Oh, that's not very good. Uh, Amy, yesterday was a horrible day down here, but it's it's a lot better. So maybe it'll be better your way in a few hours. You never know. So the intention is to try and do this flight uh, on VATSIM if we can, although VATSIM seems to be fairly quiet this evening. We are all connected up to it though, so hopefully that's going to work if I find the right window. And what we'll do is jump inside the TBM and have a look at what we're going to do. So this is the latest uh, beta version as far as I'm aware. It's got things like the uh, AOI fixed and a lot of um, little things that have been tidied up from the video series last year. It's been a long time since I flew this so no laughing at the procedures that we get wrong. Huh? Payload wise uh, I've loaded it all up already. We've got uh, pilot, passenger, rear seat passenger, 50 kilos and 10 kilos seems about reasonable and fuel wise we have got full tanks in both sides and both of the fuel caps are back on we'll take the covers the static wick covers the probe protectors off and we should be ready to close up so the flight as i said it's from biggin hill which is in the southeast of england up towards uh, inniskillen in northern ireland and it really demonstrates the flexibility. The thing I love about this TBM, we're going to do a, a cruise at uh, about flight level 280, maybe up to 300. And then we'll do the, the final stages at low level across Northern Ireland, um, down at 5,000 feet, doing 180 knots. It's um, The aircraft can pretty much do everything. So let's fire it up. See if I can remember what to do. Has everybody in the chat uh, got the TBM? You all know what you're doing with it, I'm sure. But we've got the passenger option switch here. This is one that people get confused. They actually change the placard on the later aircraft, as I understand it. Um, the passenger option switch is now labeled stow and deploy. So we should always leave the passenger option switch selected off, but we'll put the main option switch on. Then on the rest of the overhead, just make sure everything is selected off. Everything is down and off with the exception of ignition and the uh, ALT is set to the off position as well. Down here, switches off. I'll reset the parking brake to make sure there's this pressure in there. Fuel, I'll make the fuel selector on the left tank here. Trim the lever of death. That's all switched off. Uh, air conditioning is off. Circuit breakers are all in. Static source, ram air. Hey, Yearning, how's it going? Hope you're having a super evening. This is the uh, Hot Start TBM 900 we're going to be flying this evening. Check the uh, gear extension lever is closed as well. Right, so all we've got to do is really fire it up and get going. What I'm going to do is rather than use the ground power car, my battery's in good shape. So what we'll do is I'll just lift the crash bar. And we'll do all the programming on the battery. Uh, we'll use the PFD only for it because it saves a little bit of current drain. Yeah, it's a super aircraft yearning. It's one of my favorites in the simulator. So once the Garmin comes to life, we'll uh, check in here. There we go. And that's fat sim in the background as well. So what we'll do is I'll set up the PFD. Wait for that to be. There we go. Right, so, warning. Okay. thank you. I'll declutter the PFD, I'll switch it to terrain and nick shroud and traffic, zoom out to a reasonable distance. Uh, on the PFD... Fun and traffic is 287 Delta, it's coming through 
just turn them off one, just now. Right, one, one, zero. Oh, hang on, it's come to. There we go. So, window selected on. We've got Call the system test. That as well, okay. thank you. Bearing selector to GPS. I'll put the DME selector on. Uh, back out of that menu. OBS is there. CDI is set to GPS. That's fine. ADF and DME, not an issue for the time being. Transponders 2000 standby. So let's load up the route. I've got um, Avatab up here as well, just as a kind of visual aid for me if you want to fly along as well. You're, the routing we need is up here. Just come on to the flight plan page and I'll just uh, clear that out. We're going from Biggin Hill to EGAB. Obviously the um, keyboard doesn't work when it's just the PFD. At the Yeah, when it's just the primary flight display, we don't have a keyboard, which is, you know, just one of these things. But look at the battery drain. It's only four amps in this case. So the voltage is fine and it'll last for a long time. EGAB in the skillin. And then we're simply going to load the departure. So procedure, select departure. And it's going to be the Brickman's Park 2. That's fine. Runway 2, 1 for the departure. And we we'll scroll down to the end of it and we'll just load the route. So I click menu, load airway. And we're going to have the uh, Lima 10. I don't know why I've got two entries for each of the airways. I think I must have done something silly with my nav data, but it uh, doesn't matter. Lima 10 to Buzzard. After Buzzard, menu, load airway. It is the Tango 420 to Trent. After Trent, it is Upper Quebec 4. And that goes to Wallasey, nearly there, fairly short route. And it's it's not a hassle at all to load it on the on the PFD. The MFD doesn't really add that much extra battery, but uh, extra battery drain, but no big deal. After Wallasey, it's the Lima 10, and we're going to go to Ringa, which should be north there. Ringa, done. Right, and that is pretty much the route loaded. What we need to work out is whether or not there's any VATSIM controllers online that can give us a clearance. So this is like the priority list for Biggin Hill, if you like. We don't seem to have any, no, there's no uh, sector controllers whatsoever. Hey Totorico, do you recognize this aircraft? It's been a while. It's not going to be perfect, to guarantee it. The flying that is. Right, so there's no uh, air traffic control online. Um, so what we're going to do is simply leave the transponder set to 2000 for the IFR conspicuity. If we look at the departure, because that's where it can get a little bit interesting on this. If I load the airport. So we're going to depart off runway 21 and make a right hand turn out towards Detling. Now, Biggin Hill is just uh, very close by where we um, flew the helicopter a couple of days ago. In fact, there's the helicopter route still on the, the chart. Biggin Hill is outside controlled airspace. It's not connected to the airspace structure. It does have departure routes, but they're not standard instrument departures. They're just agreed departure routes. So this kind of red area here is controlled airspace at 2,500 feet. Okay, above 2,500 feet is the London Class A airspace. If you look in here, coming off Biggin, we're going to turn right back over the head field at 2,400 and then not above 2,500 and then 4,000 feet. So we are stepping up into controlled airspace, but initially we are outside controlled airspace. It's also got a rather tight turn on the departure. It says as soon as practical, turn right. 220 degrees and at 1D from the Biggin, turn right to Biggin, intercept 275 in bound to Detling. So the laminar navigation code isn't really going to do a great job on that. And to be honest, if it was um, if it was uh, being flown for real, I'd just fly it manually. So that's what we'll do in this case as well. There's not really much else we can set up on the PFD because none of the uh, MCP or the control panels work. So let's just fire up the aircraft. What's my battery voltage? 25.8, so it costs us 0.1 of a volt to set up the flight plan on the PFD. I'm going to put the battery and the main gen on. Trying to make sense of it is so confusing. The British airspace, it's only really an issue uh, 
If you're an airline driver, a tube liner driver, it's no different from anywhere else. And if you're a Cessna driver that only flies VFR, it's not really any different from anywhere else apart from the low ceilings. It's only if you try to do TBM kind of things that it gets interesting. You've got um, the issue of departing IFR into Class G airspace. Uh, that's when it gets a bit exciting. So let's finish the setup now that we've got the battery online. I'll check on the system page here, make sure that we've got the correct uh, fuel remaining figure. Now, if you're a business driver, yeah, it might get even more fun at uh, a slightly higher airspeed total, that's for sure. Um, landing field elevation is set. What we can finish up here is the radio and the MCP setup. I'll keep an eye on the battery voltage, but we should be fine. So I need to take off, fly overhead the Biggin VOR and then into the Detling VOR. So what I want to do is really have the Detling VOR displayed um, because that's the one I'm going to home in towards. However, I do need to recognize one mile from the Biggin VOR. So what I'm going to do is bring up Vig, uh, Biggin momentarily, 115.1. It idents uh, on there as what well, should be Biggin on there. And then what I'm going to do is use the DME button here. I'm going to come down and I'm going to set my DME mode to hold. Okay. Now with DME to hold, I can swap back to Detling. And I've now got the DME from Biggin, this one here, and the pointer for Detling. So I need to fly overhead Biggin. But if I establish on that radio 195 towards Detling, then I will be overhead Biggin as a matter of course. And it gives me that countdown to the turn. Our initial altitude is 2,400 feet, so I'll put that on the altitude selector. And I'm going to push the toga button to get the flight directors. I'm going to set a heading of uh, 220, and I'm going to tell it to use GPS nav. So this is a rare case uh, in the departure where I'm going to ignore the flight directors. I'm going to fly through them. I'll leave the flight directors on so you can see what uh, X-Plane is trying to do. But this picture on the chart doesn't look anything like what we expect it to do. So what I'm going to do on the departure is hold the aircraft at about 110, 150 knots with the first stage of flap selected and just concentrate on keeping that turn radius nice and tight. And then we'll fly overhead biggin. Right, one final check to make sure no uh, controllers have popped online here. We've got Gatwick, Heathrow, Luton. Nope, that's fine. So we'll just fire it up. Make sure I've got, uh, yeah, it should be connected as well. Oh, one last thing. I do need to bring up um, to 0 decimal 8 and we'll put it on the selector there. Right, so we should be listening on COM1. Right, so starting the TBM. Can MD remember how to do this? It's been such a, a long time. Battery is 25.4, that's fine. And the ITT is cold, so that's not going to be an issue. Um, we're going to put the strobe lights on to tell people on the ground we're going to start. We're going to put the transponder on to tell people on the radar that we are here and ready to go. Uh, I'm going to put the boost pump to on. I'm going to check we get the warning for it. And then it's quite simply of start, in a case of starting the timer and starting the engine at the same time. Let's give it a go, see if I can remember. So starter, timer. Excellent. NG's coming up. We've got starter, ignition, and uh, main gen into low idle. I'm looking for 30% by 30 seconds. I'm feeling hot. Oh well. I can live with that. So be it. 30 by 30 is good. And we're looking for 50 by 60. There we go. Easy start up on the TBM. There's no ground power to worry about, so I'll come up to high idle and then across to flight idle. Once I've done that, I'm going to put the inertial separator on, come up on the overhead, and you can hear the boost pump is still running. See the boost pump caption is there. So I'm simply going to set it to auto, set the fuel selector to auto, and then I'm going to cycle it once twice, make sure it does behave. I'm going to put the trim switch on, 
and we are pretty much ready to move on to the checks. So first thing I've got to do is uh, check the generator out. If I come onto the system page and I go to the ELEC, there's the separator warning. So the main generator current is less than 80 amps, that means it's good to do the generator check. I'll go into the standby gen, we get a bing for the main gen, and we get the standby running, which is fine. And we'll go back to the main. Main's online, uh, voltage is reasonable, and everything is good. So having done that check, we can finally put the air conditioning on and we will not feel hot anymore. Have you ever swung a prop for real, Toto? I've never had to do it. I came close once with a fairly flat battery, but she kicked into life eventually. It's not something that I'd be overly keen on doing, if I'm being honest. Right, engine's running. Uh, let's do the uh, dacing checks. So I'm going to bring the NG up to around about 80%. Okay. Flat battery in a DA20, yeah. Flat battery is no fun. There's 80% on the NG, I'm going to flick on the air for MD ice, check the boots inflate, and get sucked back in again. I'll put those two prop and windshield on as well, and there's the inner boots. So I need to leave them for a full cycle. Whilst that's happening, um, it takes a minute for the cycle. I'm just going to check the trims. So I push forward on the electric trim and then interrupt with the AP to make sure it stops. Similarly, go the other way, make sure it stops and it's in the right band. I'll do the same with the aileron trim, cycle it both ways, make sure it responds and make sure the AP trim button disconnects it and the same with the rudder. Fairly straightforward to check the trims on the TBO. Check the autopilot out. And all we got to do is wait for the next cycle of the uh, airframe anti-ice. And that will be us pretty much there, I think. Such a good aircraft, this. Hey Sampatch, how's it going? Hope you're having a, a super evening. Here's the outer boots inflated. And wait for it. Inner boots inflated, excellent. Lights are off, switch is off, I'll come back down to ground idle, prop and windshield the ice off. Right, I think the last thing we've got to do is, well there's two things, we've got to check the flight controls. So we'll do that on the stand. Flight controls are checked. And we've also got to do a feather check on the prop. I'm never really too sure about this on the, the TBM. So what I do is just click over to feather, uh, high idle sorry, make sure it drops and then put it back. You want to, I think, minimise the amount of time it operates in that yellow band. So maybe it's just a click across and back again. Is that how you do it, Toto? I know on the on the old Senecas, if you were to take them to feather for too long, it would vibrate like crazy. So you basically just move the lever and then promptly back again. Once you see the drop, move it back again. Keep it for a few seconds. Excellent. Sweet. So that's us. We've done the... Overhead stuff, that all looks reasonable. The switch panel down here is fine. Um, I didn't check the auction mask, but we'll work on the basis that the aircraft's good. And I think we are ready to go. Uh, final check on here, make sure we're not going to break any rules. Most pilots do it in taxi. Yeah, I think so as well, uh, Toto. I just think it's... I find that when I'm heads down like this, it's very difficult to, to stay on top of everything. So I tend to do it stationary. Anyway, we'll just do a quick call on, uh, well, let me check my radios. 22.8 on COM1. Pin Hill traffic, Biggin Hill, it's Mike, Yankee, Tango, Bravo, Mike, TBM 900, taxiing out to part runway 21, Biggin traffic. Alright. I'm going to bring it back into the taxi range. Best propeller, uh, best throttle lever ever. Taxi lights on, clear left, clear right, and brakes off. Yeah, I don't think that's us. Brakes off, let's go. Have I got brakes stop? Ah, oh, I've got the chocks in. Embarrassing. There we go, there was always going to be one thing, wasn't there? That's embarrassing. Never mind, I think we got away with it. That's why you have ramp agents to do these things for you. 
it was the three blades um, that caused it, Amy. There was some kind of uh, resonance that would develop on a three blade uh, Seneca 2. Can't remember the exact specifics. Um, it had a like a keep out range, and when you feather it, you were putting it right into the keep out range. So you had to minimize the amount of time. Right, taxing out. I'm going to put the weather radar on as well, which is in here somewhere. There we go. Mode. Standby. Oh. Should I have the tax? The I should probably have the traffic system on. That might be a useful thing to have. I've never tried this before on Vatsim. See how this works. I tend to work on the basis that the um, the inertial separator is simply a thing that you have on at low altitude and on the ground. Um, I don't know if that's 100% correct, but I like to think the inertial separator does a little bit to keep the engine safe. But yeah, the, the prop is very close to the ground. You know, picking up stones and stuff, that would be... Uh, it wouldn't be pretty. You get a lot of prop damage. I used to fly a table aircraft with 18 inches of prop clearance. And um, that would that would um, pick up stones, and you still get stone chips on the prop with that. It's just the nature of it, unfortunately. Right, we'll use full length for the departure. Double check everything is set up. Hey, Intel FX, thanks very much for the follow. Good to good to see you there. It's going well. It's going well, my friend. Did you manage to get your SR22 issue sorted out, uh, Intel? Yeah, it's a beast, uh, this thing, Toto, it really is. It is just the sort of aircraft I would want to fly in real life. It is so well sorted. It's unbelievable. Right, I'm going to set the flaps to take off now. There's not much in the way of um, debris on the taxiway down here. And just before we enter the runway, we will put the uh, probes on and the. I'll put the pulse lights on rather than the taxi lights. I was just about to launch merrily on my way and then I realised I was online. So I'll stop here and then we'll make the call. Big in traffic, Mike Yankee Tango, Bravo Mike, TBM 900 departing on the Brookmans Park, uh, departure off Big in 2 1. Right, have we got everything set? I've got lights, we've got trims, flaps, probes, cast is clear, battery's good. Now right, let's go. Right, so I'll not hold it on the brakes, we'll just get underway here. So I'll set it up to about 45-50%, make sure it's in the green arc, propeller is in the green and in advance. Off we go. Keep it straight on the centre line, there's 40 knots, 50, 60, 70, 80, rotate. Positive climb, jab the brakes, gear coming up, and it says as soon as practical heading 220, so that seems like a reasonable time to do it. Just adjust my trim. There's heading 220, I'll roll level, so remember I'm flying through the flight directors at the moment. They'll command an early turn. I'm going to fly out until I get to uh, 1D, 0.7 at the moment, and just holding that pitch attitude to about 10 degrees. So I want to keep the speed back. There's 1D, I'll start the turn now. Looking for the level at 2400 as well. And uh, obviously keeping the flaps help me keep this turn back. If I've got a spare hand, I can just uh, cycle that back so you can see it. There we go. 2,400 feet to go, so I'm just going to just the pitch attitude. Again, if we creep up on it, it doesn't really matter. Just adjust the power. 
So see I'm still banking at 30 degrees. The laminar code, the nav code there is asking it to shallow off the turn. But really I want to fly towards Detling on that easterly heading, which is exactly what the departure said to do. So let's do that just now. And as it sequences, should all sort out. So there's 115 knots, level at 2400, flaps up, will increase the power. And we'll fly away. So now we should have good navigation. I'll just adjust the trim. Try and keep it roughly in trim. And then centralise the flight directors. Put the EP on. And we can relax a little bit. So we've got gear up. We've got flaps up. We've got the autopilot in. And accelerating. Off we go. Oh, it's turn rate limited. Okay, that makes sense. That does make sense. So it's simply the fact that the coding is asking for an early turn that becomes a problem. On the trip out here we can go up to 2,500 feet. So I'm going to set 2,500. I'll go into vertical speed mode. And we'll just do it a few hundred feet a minute. So I really don't want to be going too fast out here. There could be traffic in uncontrolled airspace. And even at 2,500 feet, I'm still just sitting on the base of controlled airspace. What happens when you overtop the engine? That's a question for Toto, I see. It has some kind of limiter on it. I, you can, it's got some mechanism in there that will stop it from blowing up. Let me just allow the chat. Toto was writing an answer and I got nodded. There we go. Right, I'll synchronize the heading. Written out here, we've got below 2,500 until 9D from Detling, and then 4D at 4,000 feet. That's not what we've got coded on the flight plan, though. Okay, We've got 275I and 275D. Well, you probably know the answer to this already. 9D. Nine letters in the alphabet until we get to I. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then 4D at four miles is the fourth letter, D on the alphabet. So that's why you've got these 275I and D75D as those waypoints. That's just how the, how the waypoints are coded. Well, I think we'll just uh, make it up as we go along from this point onwards with the air traffic. What I'll do is I'll wait until we get to 9D from Detling and then we'll climb up in to the controlled airspace. What you've got is London City Airport here and obviously this is just to give you spacing on the arrival traffic. Oh, I don't want a failure of the torque limiter. Don't give him ideas, Intel FX. He'll just generate another failure. So the thing about flying the TBM is I'm constantly on edge that something's going to happen with it. Mine's in good shape, but you just don't know. You just don't know. Excellent. Quick look outside. Have a look at the awesome TBM. So I've got the taxi lights on and the pulse lights rather than the landing light, just to make us a bit more obvious. If I switch the taxi light off, we've got the pulse lights by themselves. I think pulse lights are a great thing. More aircraft should have those. There's traffic. Hey, this is good. I like that. Where's my traffic? Why can I see traffic here? I need to zoom in. Oh, hang on. It's this. It is above. That's what we want. That should give us hopefully what I need to see. Right, let's start the turn. Um, let's climb up to 4,000 feet initially. Again, we'll do that in VS. And I'll turn direct to... Uh, let's go direct to Brookman's Park. So direct Brookman's Park and enter. Around we go. Just increase the power now. And now we're climbing inside controlled airspace. I'm happy to risk it with the pulse lights off. We should be safe. 
why am I saying traffic on this display and not this display? What have I done? Unrestricted, is that the... Oh, it's a 10,000 foot limit or something on it. Who knows? Uh, let's go direct and enter again just to resequence the turn. Interesting. Right, just about to level at 4,000 feet, but we'll work on the basis that if I just zoom out, I should be able to see. Yeah, there's nobody really there, so let's go up to cruising altitude. So I'm just going to dial up. Let's go for 28. So there's flight level 280 now, and what I'm going to do is just increase the power to the climb power. And I'll let it accelerate at 1,000 feet a minute. When it gets to 170 knots or thereabouts, I'll flick it into flight level change. Straightforward. So this saves it pitching up and pitching down. If I use the flight level change to acquire a speed, you'll get. Um, the aircraft will pitch around, and that's not unknown with uh, the real aircraft, or with real aircraft as well. Um, if you just lead it there in vertical speed, you can get a smoother transition. Yep, I know you can change it. Um, if I was to, let's say I want to increase to 290 knots, uh, or 190 knots with this, if I do it on the flight level change, it comes down to level flight, and then it does an abrupt change. So if I do it with the VS and just let it gradually catch up, I can use 2,000 feet a minute if I want to reduce the speed and 1,000 feet a minute if I want to increase the speed and that gives me a smoother capture on the, the target airspeed. What I'm going to do is just ease the torque back momentarily down to about 80% and I shall switch off the inertial separator. Keep an eye on the on the set, because as we bring the separator off, the torque will increase. Yeah, 100 feet a minute or so. I just like a, a minimum uh, of uh, pitching around, you know, I try, and, I try and fly it by the pitch attitude more than anything else, so if I can make a little change on the VS, get the aircraft where it needs to be, and then just use flight level change to, to lock it there. That's my, my preferred way of flying it. I think it comes from handling a, an Airbus with auto thrust. That um, if your auto thrust is in, you set the vertical speed you want, and then just wind the speed up, uh, and that will keep it at climb thrust. Well, here we are. There's London. Now this is the bat where I usually get distracted, just as the tw the um, inertial separator finishes closing, and then I get crazy torque effects. What I'm also going to do Yep, that's fine. What I'm going to do is put the um, throttle friction on. Has anybody flown the TBM that doesn't know we've got throttle friction on it? Throttle friction is great because it now means that I've got I'm getting some stutters. It now means that I've got um, the ability to make little changes on the throttle. Something's going on on the computer. Hang on. Okay, dokie. Don't know what happened there. I think there's something happening in the background. Just give me one second. I'm just going to close that. What is going on? Yeah, no, it's not Windows Update, it's something else. I don't know what's going on. Nah, we can live with it. It seems to be working again. I do need a new computer. Anyway, uh, there is a London City Airport out there. There's London City itself. 
uh, a couple of days ago, Pilsner asked about the dome. Drone traffic here, here, two, nine, nine, here, There's the dome. Looks just like it, huh? Spot on. I zoom back out again, you can see the author one, but as soon as it LODs in, you can... Author dome, 3D dome. So it doesn't have the 3D model for it. But there's London Bridge, where we turned the helicopter. There's um, that Swiss, Tentango. Nice. What do I need to do to get traffic to show on the PFD? This is the question. Alt mode at the MFD. Alt mode is set to unrestricted. There's traffic here. Is it southwest? I'd be surprised to see southwest in, in London, but it might be. Should probably synchronize the heading. There's flat level 100, climbing happily and pressurizing happily. Southwest England, yeah. These stutters are annoying. It's not done that before. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. So I, I don't need to worry about this. But the little one does work. Okay, that's cool. I can live with that. But maybe make the range a little bit bigger. That'll help me out. It's a good idea to have those traffic labels turned on then. Actually having to keep a lookout at flight level 280, that's a random thing. I saw Air Force One uh, sand patch over Dublin going from Frankfurt to, I don't know, somewhere. A bit strange. But you know, it's fair enough. So now that we've got the throttle friction on, I can just kind of ease the throttle lever forward. And I'm looking to get it to 100% torque, not a bit over. I also need them to keep the ITT in the scan as well. So um, 790 for maximum continuous, or is it 840 is what um, the manufacturer says is allowed, but 790 is recommended. Is that what it is? I have no idea, Toto. I just thought it was quite amusing. I also, I did this flight earlier just to make sure that the author that I generated was going to work properly. And on the descent towards Northern Ireland, I was keeping up with a 747-800, which I thought was good going in a TBM. So I can go up to 840 without the engine catching fire. It won't end up shortening its life. Hindsight is a curse from looking at old work. I'll, I wouldn't be so sure. This is it, it, it. It's not that old, and it's awesome. It's still awesome. I still love this thing. We're going to have a look at the um, C23 a bit later as well, leading out simulations. If you make the, um, I think everybody would agree. If you make the CL65 at least as good as this then everybody's going to be super happy, at least as good as this. And what I've seen on the streams that you've done, it's way better. Way better. I like all airplanes. I don't remember flying an aircraft I didn't enjoy. Well, I don't know. There might be one or two. Keep an eye on my traffic map. I wonder if I should be doing position calls. It seems odd to be doing position calls at flight level 280. Another league? Systems are nuts? Oh, I don't doubt it. I'm super excited to see it. But then I'm, I'm keen to see the Saab as well. I've got plans for the Saab when the Saab update releases. But yeah, the my, my big concern about the CL650 is that I don't want to fly anything else after that. How many days of it is typing yay sab now? Is that like 130 days or something? I've lost track. I think Amy's looking forward to sab.
just about there. I saw your post earlier about the, the gizmo update, that's good. So uh, Intel FX, while you're here, um, one of the things that is important on the SR-22 that you're flying that isn't so much on this aircraft is, is the climb speed, right? Um, with a more limited aircraft, like a piston-engine aircraft, even as powerful as the SR-22 is, you've got a real balance between rate of climb and cooling. So I'm comfortably climbing at 170 knots indicated at the moment. If I was in a piston-engine aircraft, uh, like the SR-22, it just wouldn't climb at 170 knots. It would be downhill at 170 knots. It will climb really well at the VX and the VY speeds, which are I can't remember, around about 80 or 90 knots on the SR-22, but your engine cooling will be through the roof. So the Totorico will explain how the cooling on a turbine engine works, but fundamentally the piston engine is cooled by the air flowing around the outside of it, whereas the turbine operates in its own thermodynamic world, if you like. It doesn't have external cooling requirements, it simply sucks in the air and expels the air and keeps itself cool that way. The oil does a little bit of cooling for it, um, but fundamentally you don't have to worry about cooling on a turbine, whereas with a piston engine aircraft, your climb speed, you have to adjust it to get the cooling sorted out. And that's where the SR-22 TN can be quite marginal as well. Yeah, exactly. It's it's all balanced, Toto. There's no there's no real issues with it here. All I'm having to do, uh, Intel, is on the climb, just keep inching the torque forward until it gets uh, either to the ITT limit or the torque limit, and it'll probably hit the ITT limit around about twenty three thousand feet or so. And you can tell because it changes from little arrow index there to little box. And people worry about flying the TVM without auto thrust, but really it's a pussycat. You you don't have to worry about it. The throttle friction, I think, is a is a great system. Yep, ninety knots. So you only ever use um, a VX and VY are only really important until about a thousand feet, or really until you're over any obstacles at the end of the runway. Um, so what happens is people get taught to fly in an aircraft like a 152 or a PA-38 or, or something that has got about 110 horsepower and 3 million hours on the engine, right? And they have a very limited performance across the board. Uh, I just need to unmod one of Toto's comments here. Guess which one uh, caused Automod to not like this comment? The uh, 150, it just climbs at one speed. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid. If you don't, um, if you try and accelerate in a 150, it won't climb. So you've got this one single climb speed. And that so happens to coincide roughly with the VY speed. Okay, so when you're en route in a 150 and you want to climb, you can't climb at 90 knots, you have to bring it back to about 70 knots. So when you're, <laughs> you're not exaggerated, when you're, when you're training, you fly along at 90 knots, you climb at 70 knots, and you descend at 70 knots, and then you cruise again at 90 knots. But that leads people into the belief that whenever you want to climb a piston aircraft, you have to come back to the optimal climb speed. And that's just not true, okay? A piston engine, there's no real advantage in getting high quickly in a piston engine, unless it's to get out of a headwind or to avoid flying into terrain. When you're flying in a, a light single, 500 feet a minute up, that's all you ever need. If it's doing more than 500 feet a minute, you could use that spare energy to get your destination quicker, okay? So I, I fly a, a, a couple of DR400s, um, between 150 and 180 horsepower. And the 180 horsepower, when it's one up, you, you don't need um, you don't need to use the best rate of climb. You just get the thing to 500 feet on the traffic pattern, climb out, lower the nose, set 500 feet a minute, and it'll climb away. Uh, and that's all you need to worry about. 
you're far better to go a little bit faster and cool the aircraft a bit better and it gives you better visibility over the nose you know if you're in a if you're in a 150 you know this is about what you can see over the nose when you're in a in a, a low speed climb you know at a high rate climb so it's much better just to fly faster if you've got that capability and the SR22 T and uh, TN and NA they've got that capability And if it's water cooled, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, diesels, you don't have to worry about water cooled engines like Rotaxes. You don't really have to worry about it, although some of the Rotax cooling systems be marginal. And even things like a Cessna 172 or a PA 28, you don't really have to worry about it because they are designed for slow flight. They're designed for the circuit. Okay. And that's another reason why the SR-22 becomes confusing. If you are, if your aircraft has a design operating speed of 80 to 90 miles an hour, 80 to 90 knots, push speed to continuing constant. I've never done that. Hang on a second. Push what? Flight level change. Nope. Oh, that one there. Oh yes, I forgot it did that. <laughs> nice. Right, so that will help out. Oh, I'm going the wrong way now. There we go. Let's zoom up a little bit. Would help if I put the power on rather than chatting as well. Huh? So you see my ITT? I'm going to keep mine at 790 because, you know. Sandpatch, I'll come back to the SR22 in a second, uh, Intel. Sandpatch, all the new stuff with the TBM that you haven't uh, seen before. Did you know the aircraft has a face? I didn't know it had a face. Does MD know about the TBM's face? I bet you Goran knows about the TBM's face. I mean, most aircraft have got a face, but the TBM's got a face that you have not seen before. You want to see it? It's like a scared robot with its, hand, its hands wide open, its arms wide open. There's the eyes, there's the scared mouth, there's the hand wing things. Scared robot face. Never noticed that before. I don't know why, I was just trying to get some screenshots and, and there she was. Scared robot face. And you can make it happy and nervous. And there we go. Yep, exactly. What were we talking about? Well, we were talking about cooling, weren't we? Yeah. <laughs> like a stingray. Exactly, Amy. Exactly. So, Intel, if you're... Um, yeah, amazing feature. It's really useful, isn't it? It's almost like it should have a shark mouth painted underneath it. Why am I running at 20 frames a second? I have had some stutters in this area, and it's because it's going from a... Um, auto area to a non auto area so it's kind of just asking a bit much of the computer it's got both sets of textures loaded at the moment it'll sort itself out oh it disconnects me that's fine don't care um let me back in there um when you're 172 is flying at 80 to 90 knots. That's its design speed. Okay, so the cooling aperture on the front of it, the, the cooling holes that you have on the 172, they are sized to keep the engine cool at 90 knots. Okay, so if you're climbing at 90 knots or 80 knots or descending at the same speed, it's getting the same amount of cooling. 152, 172, any of those slow Cessnas, right? The, the cooling uh, holes, the apertures, are sized for the operating airspeed range of the aircraft. Um, I flew 172H models total, the six-cylinder Lycoming, uh, six-cylinder Contis, they could only do about 90. But um, if you have an aircraft that goes a lot faster, like the SR-22 or a, a Piper Malibu, that sort of aircraft, the cooling apertures must be sized for the cruise speed of the aircraft. So if your aircraft cruises at 160 knots indicated or 150 knots indicated, 
you don't want the engine to get too cold in the cruise. So you can't have oversized holes fitted to the front of the aircraft. You can't have oversized cooling apertures or air intakes. The side effect of that is at low speed in the pattern or in the climb out for a high angle climb, it's not getting enough cooling air through it. So you can do it, but you can't sustain it for a long period of time. Yeah, if that kind of makes any sense. Yeah, you need cowl flaps, which the SR-22 doesn't have. Excellent, we're going to level at 2.8, and this, um, yeah, kind of working well. This is the flexibility of the TBM, you know, just getting up to flight level, sailing along, and then happily going down to low level uh, VFR altitudes. I don't know, uh, Sandpatch, so I... Uh, I don't have much love for the SR-22. Um, I didn't have much love for the SR-22. Um, it's not an aircraft that I ever really had a desire to fly from a general aviation perspective. Um, simply because it's, it didn't really float my boat, really. Um, since flying the Torx M1, I can appreciate what they've done and why they've done it. And the number one thing that really gets your attention with the SR-22 is how hard they try to keep the pilot safe or, and without being disrespectful to MD, how hard they try and protect the pilot from themselves. Because if you look at the, the operating history of the SR-22, it does have a record of people being in places they perhaps shouldn't have been for some other reason other than flying, if that kind of makes any sense. You know, my, I think I said on the SR-22 series that my job is as a professional pilot, okay? I get paid to take people safely from A to B. That is the business that I'm in. I don't do anything in the intervening period. I, I don't have anything on my mind when I'm getting airborne apart from doing that job safely. Because if I'm running late, if I'm running 45 minutes late, then the worst scenario is I'm not going to get a milkshake on the way home because it's going to be closed. That's pretty much it. But when I get to the car park, I'm not going to get a milkshake. If I'm, I'm a, a SR22 owner pilot and I'm on my way to a business meeting and the weather's looking a bit marginal, but it's probably okay, you then start to have those other dangers kick in. Um, and that's really what Cirrus are trying to protect you from. So. Uh, to a certain extent, the TBM is similar, but I think the I think the training on the TBM is probably much more it, it, well, focused on this kind of performance. Yeah, drink milkshakes exactly. I keep people safe. That's the that's the objective. If they've got problems with their business meetings later, they can worry about that because I'm keeping them safe. But not something for the crews, you know. So you can see it on the SR-22 checklist design, that the checklist is huge. I mean, it, it is fundamentally a uh, Cessna 172. There's nothing more complicated than that aircraft. Um, you know, it's got a mixture knob. It's got a power lever that makes it go faster and slower. It doesn't even have wheels that go up and down. All right, so it, it's a very straightforward aircraft. And there's something like 32 items on the checklist. There's a huge amount of items on the checklist just to get the engine started. The reason that's all there is to slow the, the pilot down. You know when, when you boot it up and it's got the the um, are you safe kind of thing? That's all there to, to keep you safe. Yeah, exactly. Um, we are bus drivers, Goran, exactly that. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's not so much a, it's not a glamorous, glamorous profession. We don't get off in Tahiti and spend 15 hours, uh, 15 days doing nothing, you know, we have a 35 minute turnaround and fly home again. Um, it's just, it's just about keeping people safe. The mixture, um, yeah, they did want to go fade out with it. That was the whole point with the SR-22, is they, they were looking to make the engine a lot easier to operate. There was actually an STC for it that gave you prop control back again for 
pilots that wanted to be pilots, they could control the prop. Um, because it was supposed to be electronic, but it's really just a mechanical lever. There's just a mechanical interconnection underneath there that links everything together. It's a bit of a weird design. I need to have a look at the descent before I get distracted talking about other stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the flight plan page and I'm simply going to scroll down to the end. I'm going to choose Ringa and I'll put 5,000 feet in here. I enter. I'll come down here and I'll tell it I'm going to do at least 3.5 degree descent angle. Okay, that should give me about 2,000 feet a minute. So enter it on there. So Ringa at 5,000 feet. Um, why have we got 5,000 feet at Ringa? So this is another thing about UK airspace. Not so much the airspace, just the fact that lots of airfields don't have instrument approach procedures. Okay, I'm going to bring up the Abitab here, and if I go on to uh, Lucky Dip, this one here, Mercator, Northern Iron, right. So this is a little nav map, map, map. Um, I've put some bases of controlled airspace in here. I had to draw these on manually because little nav map doesn't provide those. But Ringa, uh, another little thing for your um, TBM pilots with the flight plan page displayed. You know that when you're in cursor mode, it will center on the waypoint. But if you can see your airplane in the middle, you're not in cursor mode, it's centralized on the aircraft. Anyway, Ringa here. Let's zoom out a bit. Ringa. This is the Ards Peninsula, and this is Strangford Loch, I want to say. You can see the same thing here. So, so Ringa is basically this little bit here. So coming in from the southeast, I'm going to descend down to 5,000 feet at Ringa. Now, we're not going to fly to Belfast Aldergrove. This is Belfast Aldergrove here. This is Belfast City. We're going to fly west, outside controlled airspace, across to Enniskillen here in uh, Loch Erin. This is lower Loch Erin in Enniskillen. Okay. There's no controlled airspace around there, and these symbols here are instrument approaches. There's no instrument approaches. So to get my TBM into Enniskillen, I've got to come up with a strategy to get into VFR conditions. Now, it looks like a nice day outside, so I could pretty much stay high and then hope to descend and maintain visual flight conditions on the descent. For me to be IFR, I've got to be safe uh, from the terrain. I've got to be above the MSA and flying at the right altitudes. Okay, so these are the maximum elevation figures plus a thousand feet on there. So if I was flying westbound at 4,500 feet, Outside controlled airspace, uh, sorry, westbound at um, 6,000 feet, outside controlled airspace, I would still be complying with the instrument flight rules. Even outside controlled airspace in Class G airspace, I could be quite happy at 6,000 feet. In order to descend below 6,000 feet, I need to be visual with the terrain and be flying VFR or I need to be on an instrument approach or being radar vectored. Now 6,000 feet is a fairly high cloud base for Northern Ireland. That's, uh, you know, if you have a cloudy day, something between 1,500 and 3,000 feet would be much more reasonable. Okay, so I really want to have a plan B. Now, I don't fly this sort of profile. I don't have a TBM 900. If I did, I would tell you exactly how to do it for real. What I would plan to do if I had a flight in an aircraft like this, is plan the flight to a destination that I know has an instrument approach, or at least plan the flight so that I can reach a destination that has an instrument approach. So I'm flying the aircraft towards Belfast at the moment. 5,000 feet at Ringer will let me fly the approach into Belfast quite happily. And at some point during that descent towards Belfast, I will become visual with the terrain and I'll be able to continue uh, under VFR rules. Okay. 
So looking at these airspace altitudes here, I'll be inside controlled airspace, descend down to 5,000 feet inside controlled airspace, still inside because I'm still above the, the, the base level there. And then as I track to the west, I'll be outside controlled airspace around about uh, Bambridge here. If for whatever reason we are not in VMZ conditions, then we could ask the Belfast controllers to vector us down. They could um, they could um, vector us down to 2,000 feet or 1,500 feet. That would be allowed. And hopefully at some point on that vector, we would become VMC and we could continue. Worst case scenario, we could fly an ILS, we could break out at 600 feet, and we could fly visually at that point, although that is stretching it a little bit. That's on the jerry end of the scale, okay? But quite reasonably, yeah, we can accept a direct below MSA. Um, there are, there's other charts, Sandpatch. Um, let's have a look at the... I don't know if Navigraph has these. Let me have a look. Should be one. If I search for EGAA. Belfast Order Grove. Yeah, that one. Do I have... Radar minimums. Here we go. So yeah, Belfast Order Grove. Um, Without touching on the politics of it, because it, there's no need to get into that, Belfast Order Grove had military facilities on the airfield as well as civilian facilities. And as part of the military uh, side of things, you've got surveillance radar approaches to every end of the runway. That means you can have a radar talk down, if you like. You don't need to fly. Uh, you don't need any equipment on the aircraft. You can fly a heading and an altitude and a time based on the radar controller. So at Alder Grove, these are the, the uh, four runway ends. You can be vectored down to 1,700 feet simply under radar vectors. And this is what Toto is talking about. These are the minimum vectoring altitudes. Okay, so they could comfortably vect you down 2,000 feet, 1,700 feet. Okay, and this line here, 2,200 feet, there's a ridge of terrain to the south of Belfast City Airport here. But you can you can be vectored below the the MSA quite happily. It's it's a confusing subject because of the different uses of the terminology. Uh, let me just sort this turn. That's going to do it. Sorry. Right. So the MSA changes depending on on really what you're you're using it for. If you were a VFR pilot. I don't know. Sandpatch, did you see the um, PT-19 nav video that I did? It's okay if you haven't. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, in that video, I talked about using the, the grid altitudes here. These are called the minimum off-route altitudes. Now, Skyvector uses different figures. Okay. But these, in Little Nav Map, are the highest terrain it can find in a latitude-longitude box, plus 1,000 feet. If it can find terrain above 5,000 feet, it's plus 2,000 feet. So what this is telling me is the highest terrain it could find was 2,800, 3,100, 3,100. Okay? So what, I'm, what MSA am I going to use? I could use the minimum off-route altitudes, but that would be fairly restrictive. You see, I know that that 3A is probably caused by this terrain here, and 4-1, well look, that's that's Loch Ney there, there's there's no way you could fly over that at 600 feet and not fly into anything. 4-1 is probably driven by the mountains down here, you know, there's, there's not that much significant terrain in Northern Ireland. So when you get an operational flight plan, a company flight plan, it will have an MSA for every leg. But that uses a bandwidth, it's called. So rather than looking at the grid altitudes, they will simply, the, the planning software, will simply draw a line 5, 10 or 20 miles either side of the track and assess the terrain underneath that band, if you like. So the MSA is something that the pilot themselves decide. You know, you, you choose your MSA depending on what your ops manual says, and if you're an operator, an owner-operator, you do it yourself. Um, and on the airways charts, they're published as well. But the, the minimum on-route altitudes can be 
uh, depending on Navid reception in the US as well. That's why you sometimes have two. Um, but with the European system, it's the same thing. The charts still have them published, but some companies would use a wider bandwidth than what the airways assessed for. So, for example, um, let me just I can pop this out. If I just zoom out a little bit. So basically what I've done, I'm going to wait for Explain to redraw a map. It's really stuttery at the moment. I think it's I think it's the fight Volantis running in the background, I have to say. Um, we came out of Biggin Hill and we turned north and then west. Okay. If we got a an early turn, let's say Birmingham didn't exist and I turned left early then that would have taken me outside of the airway. Okay. So what airlines try and do is they give you an MSA bandwidth that allows for those directs, allows for that corner cutting. So sometimes what you've got on the airway is relevant. Sometimes your company will give you a higher altitude for each of those legs. That makes sense. The Navi debugger, I looked at it, yeah, I looked at it last for the, um, when I was doing the NDB tracking to see where I could receive the NDB and where I can. It's pretty cool. The, the, the big issue with flying the TBM, as always, is you go back into another aircraft and you go, oh, I kind of wish I had that. But, you know, just what we have to live with. No, no worries at all. It's It's always... I always like to try and give people enough information so they can know what to Google, if you like. You know what you to... I don't want you to feel shortchanged with that question. Sometimes I probably go overboard on that. I do love the TBM, though. It's like seeing an old friend that you haven't flown... Or you haven't, you ha if you haven't chatted to an old friend for a while and you see them, um, you've got catching up to do. It's the same as flying this TBM, you know, it's, it's like an old friend. Because it's in the beta version, I copied the state file just, you know, because I didn't want anything to happen to her accidentally. But, you know, it's still a, it's still a fairly young one, this one at 54 hours. I think um, I've spent a lot on GPU with it, but it's had an oil change and it's had something else. I can't remember what else I had to do to it. What I should have done is I should have un... I saw Toto mention DME and then I thought, oh wait, I've not done that. Let's put it back to the have. There we go. So that's a really useful feature, a DME hold and the SAB. Hey, thanks, Jerning. Um, have, uh, have a good night, have a good rest, and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining the stream again. Much appreciate uh, your repeat business here. The, um, the SAB has got DME hold on those lovely Collins radios as well, and the SAB is just delightful to fly with the GPS turned off. Um, the, the nav radios on it are fantastic. It's just enjoyable. The problem you have is charting now. You know that those kind of airways don't exist in the UK, but um, I've been kind of making a list of the different airways the SAB flew, uh, flies on, so that I've got my own navigation map if you like for flying the sound. Just need to mute the microphone for one second. Hang on. I'm right back with you. I was wearing my glasses today and glasses and the headphones don't really go together. Cool, so how far have we got until top of descent? The most important thing. 13 minutes. So if MD's keen, when we get to uh, Inniskillen, we're going to swap over onto the C-23 and then we'll do some uh, local VFR flying. We have got... How do we do this? How long is it going to take to get to Inniskillen? It's going to take us... I don't believe that. Oh yeah, 14 minutes. No, that's fine. About 40 minutes do we get to Enniskill. So 
hopefully um, we can keep that sim logged in and then we could do some group flying if you're if you're keen on that. I thought we'd fly from Enniskillen over towards uh, Sligo. It's only about 20 minutes. Should be good. Does everybody know that you can put airspace depictions into the G1000, the Lamina G1000, if you don't have them already? You only have them in the US typically, but you can load them up for other countries as well. If you can get hold of the airspace data, you can load them in. Sometimes you have to do some hand editing. On the real G1000, you can choose what to display and what not to display um, because it's set up, because Lamina Research are essentially a US company, I think. It doesn't show any Class A airspace. Um, because Class A in the US only exists above flight level 180 everywhere, so there's no need to show it. Our low level Class A in the UK gets hidden by it, so you just have to open the file and do a find replace on Class A and make it Class B so it shows up on the map. Oh, that would be sweet, Sam Patch. If they could put it into Navigraph, that would be... If Navigraph could um, update the airspace, that would be awesome. That would really make a big difference. It's really... It's the airspace presentation that people miss when it comes to BFR planning. And I think, even for flight, um, are links allowed? I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Hey, Social Joss, thanks for, thanks for the follow. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, the airspace definitions at low level are, are pretty um, important in most countries, in the UK especially so. Uh, and the fact that there isn't really an online display of those, there isn't a usable online interpretation is problematic. Even Forefly and Garmin Pilot, their airspace displays aren't great for the UK simply because it's a mess. I mean, you can see it on here that this... Oh, don't increase the power. You can see it on here that it's a complete mess. You know, this is... What you're looking at there is Liverpool and Manchester. So, you've got Liverpool here and Manchester here, both fairly busy airports. And you've got this kind of slot in the middle that is... Um, a low level transit route from north to south. You can do that at 1200 feet if I remember correctly and you just route down the middle. But if you were to imagine a, U a US style inverted wedding cake on those airfields, there wouldn't be any space in the middle. So the airspace has made these odd shapes to try and keep the dimensions as small as possible. Um, I don't agree with it. I think it's a silly way of doing it. It'd be much better with radar controllers um, and you just allow crossings. But I get why they've done it. Yeah, I know the history behind it. Oh, I've seen the LAX Bravo and the Coliseum and the mini routes, yeah. But it's still it's still straightforward. You've got different shelf altitudes. And um, you either you're either in it or out of it. I think the US airspace structure is so much easier to understand. It's just um I really like the US structure. I'm not a fan of the US style of controlling, if that makes sense. Oh dear, we've got traffic. 4,800 feet above. Hang on, there's another dot in there. Missed him. Can we see him? I want to see him. TCX. I was hoping we'd find a jet to overtake, but uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen tonight. Pilsner, you lost... Um Lost fat sim because it keeps dropping below 20 frames a second. Oh my goodness. The um, I only have an issue at that point at um, Birmingham where it's got those two authos loaded, um, the, the author and the, the textures. Um, the, the, I mean, for those of you on the stream that don't know, I'm running on a nine year old PC 
2500 i5 2500 and it's working hard to run it but it's still doing a reasonable job you know we're at 40 frames a second up here with some clouds on it'll go a lot better without the clouds but it looks nice with clouds the um the tbm the TBMs, uh, when, it, when it first released I couldn't run it, I'll be honest, I, I couldn't run it on release night. Um, but Toto worked really hard and Goran worked really hard to optimise it and it happened in the course of a few days that we went from having an, an aircraft that I really couldn't run to something that ran really well. And it does, it does run really well. I Previously I've never run the TBM with clouds. Falcon lets me run it with the clouds as well and it's, it's bearable. And I, I don't know, I don't think it's MD in the Hot Start um, Discord. I don't think it's MD that's got a machine that's quite as underpowered as this. Um, and it, it's only, it's only the Flight Factor A320 that becomes unusable with weather. And it just looks beautiful. I just... It's a weird thing because I hated the look of the TBM. I used to see them all the time at Bordeaux. Uh, the French military ones, I think they're the 700s, they look a bit weird anyway. But um, I never really liked the look of it until I got this one. And then I'm like, man, I only ever want to fly the TBM now. It just looks stunning, you know? It's got that long nose, but it doesn't look goofy like the PC-6 does. It's just a, it's just a nice looking aircraft. And this at the back, the, the tail shape at the back, that's pure Sakata, you see? The, the tail plane slightly aft of the thin rudder. It, it's a nice machine. And it looks muscular, you know, you see it from some angles, it looks really muscular. It's a nice aircraft. Whereabouts are you, Pilsner? Where are you flying? Oh, I should have a look to see if there's any air traffic on board. On We've got. Hey, we might have some air traffic in Belfast. Let me see if my thing is still running. I have to just shut it down. One second. Oh, it's disconnected. That's what it's on. Delaware. The spoiler going into the wing? Yeah, it's just a simple mechanical link, isn't it? Simple mechanical link between the aileron. It is a bit um, a bit unusual. Do you know why the spoilers are there, Sam Pat? Do you know the reason for them? Why do you have spoilers as well as um, ailerons? So if I pop out to the outside view, hang on, let me not get distracted talking about theory when we've got a descent. We've got four minutes, that's about enough time. Somebody start a clock. Right, so, if I want the aircraft to turn left, I'm going to move the stick left and the aileron on the left hand side is going to go up and the aileron on the right hand side is going to go down. That's to help it into the turn. Okay, so the aircraft rolls left by lifting this, elevate, this aileron and lowering this aileron. Now, you think about the aileron as deflecting air, but fundamentally what it does is it changes the effective angle of the wing. So with the tail end of the aileron up, the net cord line, if you like, changes to this angle here. And with the aileron down, the cord line changes like this. So what that means is you're producing more lift on one side and less lift on the other side. And lift is drag. You can't have lift without drag. So to roll left, I reduce the drag on this side and I increase the drag on this side. So as the aircraft banks left, the nose is pulled to the right. And that's called adverse yaw. Now these are fairly high aspect ratio wings. That means they're quite long and quite thin. With a high aspect ratio, your ailerons much further out on the wings, you get a significant amount of adverse yaw. And one of the ways you can cure adverse yaw 
is by either fitting differential ailerons such that they only reduce lift on this side, they don't increase lift on that side, or as with the TBM you can have spoilers. So when you roll left, the left hand wing will experience a reduction in lift, a reduction in drag from the aileron, but the spoiler will put that drag back and it will cause a reduction in lift and an increase in drag and that helps coordinate the aircraft. So you can use spoilers, you use spoilers to offset adverse shaw. And that's one of the reasons you see them on airliners and aircraft like this. Yeah, and the gliding video as well. I talk about adverse shaw in the gliding video. Airliners do it for another reason as well, that um, the, some aircraft have got high speed and low speed ailerons, and you've got low speed ailerons out on the wingtips and high speed ailerons uh, in at the root. That's simply to reduce the bending load on the wings at high speed. You only use the inboard ailerons to turn. Um, but that's all automatic. But the, the spoilers help with adverse yaw. They, they can, you can tune it so there's virtually no adverse yaw at the operational speeds. Yeah, lots of mass to roll. Absolutely. I saw those videos, I didn't know they worked um, quite as independently as that. It's, it's weird to see them flap around. One two eight decimal five. Was that one two eight? One two eight five. Let's just tune it up just in case he's there. If I do one two eight decimal five, oh, I've done it the silly way. Now let's put 128.5 on this radio and let's put COM2 on so I can listen to Unicom as well. Right, well we're still outside of any kind of VATSIM control so I'm just going to dial the track. altitude down to 5,000 feet. And I'll push the uh, VNAV button. That will take me downhill when we get to the top descent. You can see it's drawn the top descent on the nav display as well. Super Demona. That's like a similar to a Grob 109, isn't it? The Super Demona. Yeah. Awesome. I think um any kind of flying, people can be quite snobby about flying, but I like um, I like flying pretty much anything. Oh yeah, I'm not going to bring the power off on the descent, Toto, don't be silly. Keep the power on. Speed recovery. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, 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 know the, I know what the Demona looks like. Um, I've never flown one, I've only flown a 109. But it's good fun. So what I'm doing, what Toto's talking about here, is I'm not changing the power setting really. I'm keeping the aircraft around about 780, 790 ITT and just accelerating downhill. We don't need to slow down. The reason you do an idle descent in a jet is because you're already operating pretty much as fast as you'd want to ever take that aircraft. So there's no point in keeping the power on in the descent. But with this aircraft, we can keep the power on and go downhill. What we have to keep an eye on is the torque increasing as we descend into denser air. Uh, so I'll have to nudge that back as we go lower. Otherwise it's straightforward. Yeah, exactly. Idle thrust is a, is a thing. If you, on the Airbus, if you pull for open descent at 39,000 feet, it'll be doing 4,000 feet a minute before you know it. Audible approach, easy at 45, uh, type 80 20, weather vision uniform, sight level uh, 160. Easy at 45, audible radar, thank you. Expect vector for the RMP approach from 07 via Lurgy, Squawk 6336. I should maybe speak to this guy. Straight to LMP, Victor's right, LMP, 
Probably get his ATIS first of all, that would be the done thing. Uh, 26125, let's just do that on box one just for a sec. Yeah, four, five, thank you. Descend flat level 100. Descend flat level 100, easy, 845. 26125. I'm going to just bring the torque down to level. Information uniform. Time 2320 Zulu. Uniform. Runway in use zero 07. Surface wind zero 060 zero degrees 6 knots. Visibility 10 kilometers or more broken 1100 feet broken 2000 feet. Temperature plus 4. Dew point plus 3. QNH 1009. Acknowledge receipt of information uniform and advise aircraft type on first contact. Excellent. So you hear those broken at uh, 1,200, broken at 2,000 something. That's the kind of weather I was talking about, that we wouldn't be able to maintain VFR conditions in the TBM. We'd need to fly an approach or we'd need to be radar vectored down to a lower level in order to see the ground and then continue visually. Um, that being said, I'm on my own weather, so I don't have to worry about it. So let's give this guy a call. Just double check, I'm on the right frequency one more time. Two, six. And where are we? We are overhead the Isle of Man. Excellent. Autogrove approach, good evening. It's uh, Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, TBM 900, uh, routing towards Enniskillen. Currently approaching the India Oscar Mike VOR, descending flight level 200 to altitude 5,000 feet inbound ringer. Tango Bravo Mike, autograph radar, Roger, Squawk 4263. Squawk 4263, Mike, Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, and we've got your information uniform. Mike, Bravo Mike, Roger, break, break, easy 845, continue on the radar, heading descent, flight level 80. Transponder 4263. Descent level 80, easy 845. And continue on the radar, heading. And continue on the radar, heading, easy 845. Uh, Mike, Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, can you just confirm? Where your destination airport is, I've got you going to um, Angelo. Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, uh, A from destination Enniskillen St Angelo, Echo Golf Alpha Bravo. My intention is descend towards uh, Ringer, maintain VFR from Ringer westbound direct St, uh, St Angelo. Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, Roger, descend flight level 100. Descend flight level 100, Mike Bravo Mike. Right. I'll fix that then. So I'll go back to flight level 100 and standard. There we go. Awesome. Well, add some interest, doesn't it? Torque is getting hot. Oh yeah, it'll be all right. I tend to let it go up to, if I see it above 95, I'll take action and then bring it down again. You just need to keep an eye on it. And this is where the throttle friction kind of really, really helps out because you can make little movements on it. Probably need to prepare the aircraft for some ice as well. So I'm going to put the initial separator on and the prop, uh, the ice on, just in case it's going to be, what, minus, minus 13 up here. So there could be some ice off this. Put the separator in just to be sure. Check the ITT first. Toto, why is that? Does it have a. Does it make. Alright, okay. Tango Bravo Mike, descend flight level 80. Descend flight level 80 and Mike Bravo Mike. Ding. Oh wow, yeah. This is, I don't operate it towards the limits, you see, I do fairly moderate speeds and uh, it's never become an issue. Excellent. That makes sense. 
whenever I'm dealing with the inertial separator on the climb out, I tend to bring the torque back to about 80, 75%, 80% before switching it off. And that way when it increases as the separator goes away, uh, you don't have any issues with it. But it's good to know about that in the descent as well. Awesome. So we should be on our little chart now. There we are. So 4,500 feet. I think he kind of knows roughly what we want to do, but this is maybe a bit different. I get the impression that VATSIM is full of tubes, <laughs> tube liners. Uh, group flight, we can do it at um, Inniskillen, St. Angelo. It is Echo Golf Alpha Bravo. And then we'll fly to Sligo, which is just the southwest. It's about 20 miles. I can't remember. EI, Echo India, Sierra Golf, I think. Yeah, I, my kind of thing with the separator Toto is if I'm expecting to be in icing conditions in the climb, I'll just leave the separator on until I'm out of it, if you like. Uh, in my mind, it's the same as the seat belts on the. On the April five turn left, heading three zero zero degrees and descent to altitude four thousand feet. Oh, good news, Sam Patch. Be good to have you. Heading three zero zero and descent four thousand feet. Easy April five. So we can see Strangford Loch on the synthetic vision. We can see that we're flying with a, I guess, a, a negative Can angle of attack. Nose down, vectors here, not causing any issues. Yeah, you become limited above uh, 170 to 180. Ice conditions at Intel. Um, depends on the aircraft type, but most uh, it's accepted really that icing conditions exist between plus 10, plus 5, plus 10 um, on the total air temperature, the, like the including the dynamic heating, down to about minus 40 still air temperature. So anything above plus 10, anything below plus 10, and anything above minus 40, uh, you'll be in potentially in icing conditions. Take the Concorde, yeah. Find something slow. I mean, you can do it in a TBM. It's fine. Just I'll be flying the Sundowner, so be a bit slow compared to this. Yep, you get ice crystal icing at high altitude, um, but not much up there. Yeah, minus forty Celsius uh, Intel FX. So the way it's handled with a turbine jet is uh, 1,000 feet to go. With a turbine jet, you put the engine anti ice on. You send altitude 6,000 feet with uh, Autogrove 008, Mike Tango, Mike Yankee Tango, Bravo Mike. Uh, that wasn't a very good read back because that is not the QNH that I'm going to set because I'm on standard weather. So 6,000 feet, 1013, and he asked for 1008. Excellent. Yeah, that's the Isle of Man, Pilsner. Just behind us, we, we flew right overhead. You should have waved. Yeah, minus 56. Uh, minus 70 is the thermal limit on the aircraft. Uh, Intel FX. 1,000 feet to go. A Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike is approaching Ringer. Are you okay if we uh, self-maneuver on track uh, in Vertical this going? Track. Uh, Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike, uh, if I'm in just confirmation, is this you cancelling your IFR here? Uh, IFR, we can cancel IFR if that works for you. Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike. I'm not allowed to force you to make that decision, I'm down to you. <laughs> uh, AFRM, Mike, Bravo Mike, cancel IFR please. Mike, Yankee Tango, Bravo Mike, Roger, IFR, cancel at time zero four. can reach direct to uh, St. Angelo. 
President Angelo, thank you, and it's uh, VFR flight conditions. Mike, bravo, Mike. So that's a bit of a VATSIM oddity. That's not what you'd get in, in real life. I don't need to cancel IFR to do what I want to do. I can continue the flight in IFR. Um, that's that's not how it actually works. It's no big deal, though. I can still fly IFR outside controlled airspace, so... Yeah. Hello, Mike. Can you take your brother, Mike? Outside controlled airspace, what service do you require? Uh, Mike Bravo Mike, we can take a basic service. Mike Anchor Tango Bravo Mike, Roger, you're cleared to leave the older grid control zone or correction control airspace on track St. Tangelo, not above altitude, uh, so let's get altitude 5,000 feet, QNH1008. Okay, QNH1008 will leave not above altitude 5,000 feet. Mike Bravo Mike. Alright, so let's get down to a VFR altitude. 4,500 feet. Seven, 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 Easy 202 Bravo, over to go for it, Roger, clear to Glasgow, find a proper 600 airway, climb initially altitude yeah, 5,000 feet. That's the Isle of Man behind us, Pilsen, this is... Strangford Lock here, Alds Peninsula, on the left hand side we've got Dundrum Bay here, Mounts of Moran there. On the right hand side this is Belfast Lock, and out the front you've got Loch Ney up here. Yeah, it, it, I don't know. I'll put it down to be a, a VATSIMism, but you don't... Cancelling IFR isn't a thing in the UK. It just doesn't have to happen. Um, quite simply, because if I'm outside controlled airspace, VFR, I have to avoid clouds, okay? I have to be a thousand feet away from clouds. If I'm IFR, I don't have to be. I can still assure my own terrain separation. I can still fly along enjoying the view. But all I need to be is at an appropriate level. So 4,000 feet uh, in this case would be below the grid altitude, so maybe not ideal. But 6,000 feet would keep me on an IFR level above the MSA, complying with the instrument flight rules outside controlled airspace. Um, and then I don't have to worry about manoeuvring around cloud. Simple as that. So yeah, no biggie. The basic service that came in 13, 14 years ago. Thank you. We're basic outside for Mike Bravo Mike. It used to be flight information service like the whole of the rest of the world, but pilots were expecting a traffic service. They were expecting to be deconflicted or given vectors around other traffic. So they changed it to a basic service. Uh, it's it's bizarre. Um, basic service is essentially a flight information service, and traffic service is what we used to call a radar advisory service. Um, and then you've got a deconfliction service, which is I don't know similar but different for IFR flights. And then there's a procedural service, which means the controller. Well, I don't even I can't even remember procedural services. Don't use it. All I know is that in some parts of Scotland that we're flying into, if I take a traffic service or a deconfliction service, it means that I get a continuous descent, whereas if I stay inside controlled airspace on the way into, for example, Aberdeen, uh, I have to use the speed brake all the way downhill to stay inside controlled airspace. So it's just weird. It's the UK being weird. VFR should be simple, sand patch, but it, planning is planning is difficult. Ireland's the same. Uh, sand patch Ireland has got class C and class G, and, and that's it. And it's very straightforward. The UK is just historically a mess, really. So, with me, so I'll be leaving controlled airspace. Let me cross this blue line here. What was I going to do? I was going to hand fly it once we're outside controlled airspace. So for you uh, TBM pilots, 
my feeling is that at 200 plus knots, it's a bit on the heavy side for, tower, for, for hand flying. So now I'm flying it, I just slow it down to about 180, and then it's much more pleasant to hand fly it. I don't know what the real pilots do with it. Why don't they have controlled airspace? Yeah, I don't understand it. The problem is, Sam Hatch, that um, everything in the UK is done on a shoestring budget, right? It doesn't have to be, but it, it, this is going to turn into a rant, and I'm sorry. In the US, you've got 100% radar coverage, okay? So your controllers are paid for by taxpayer dollars in the US, and they're there to provide you a service. As a private citizen with an airplane, the government owes you that level of service. In the UK, it's not like that. Now, Part of the reason it's not like that is because post-war little airplane pilots just wanted to go where they wanted to go. They didn't foresee that things would change. So when your airliners were 17-seat twin pistons, they weren't much faster and heavier than your light aircraft, so they could all get on quite happily. And when faster aircraft and jets came along, somebody realised or somebody decided it was a bad idea to have these aircraft mixing. And rather than do what the US did and just put radar controllers everywhere, the UK decided to segregate them by using what they called airways. So they established a, a corridor of controlled airspace. And they only provide radar cover inside those corridors. Now in these days, with a processed radar picture available for the whole country, they could have exactly the same system, but somebody would need to pay for it. And our air traffic services are privatised, so nobody pays for it. If you're, this flight in a TBM would cost us a fair bit of money in on-route charges. We would have to pay uh, Eurocontrol for the privilege of being controlled which is a bit silly in the first place. Yep, yeah, privatised. Mm -hmm. Privatised air traffic. Right. Easy zero, four, six, seven, seven, one, four, your is a face. So, what I'm going to do is just bring the power back. Oh, I should probably put the flashing uh, lights on as well. Push and stop roof face south, uh, and we're probably trying to make some room for that east jet. I'm going to turn the throttle friction off. I'm just going to bring it back to... Yeah, it, it, it's frustrating in an operational perspective. Um, and it's a chicken and egg situation, we would say, in, in English as well. That Because of the UK's airspace structure, aircraft like the TBM really don't feature heavily in the UK. UK general aviation is microlights and Rotax powered little airplanes that don't have IFR capability. So to operate heavy piston IFR and turbine IFR as a private operator, it's just difficult. Um, right, I'm going to take the autopilot out, I think. I could probably turn that off. I should be paying attention. Let's have the... Ah, before I do that, one more thing. I'm going to synchronise the heading. I'm going to put it into heading mode. I'm going to push the OBS button. And I'm going to turn the course pointer to the Enniskillen inbound of 320 degrees. That's the runway heading at Enniskillen. It's over here. 320. Okay. So I'm going to continue to fly on the little needle. <laughs> Uh, okay, GPS needle here. I've yeah, got the indication for the runway here. So I'll take the autopilot out and I'll take the flight characters off and we'll just pull it along. So I just tend to come back to about 180 knots and then it's it's fairly fairly easy to hand fly. Fairly pleasant to hand fly. Have you seen the G1000 as well? If I just make that bigger, look at the V bar on here. I don't like V bars. I think they're silly. I much prefer the crosshairs, right? That's that's. Let me set up my stall first of all. I prefer crosshairs. But one of the good things about the V bar director, right, I want to maintain 4,500 feet. 
right? I'm going to start a turn to the right. So I'm going to roll to the right. I'm going to put the horizon line on top of that V-bar director. See that there? And I've got a nice 15 degree turn maintaining altitude. Okay? And I then put the horizon bar on the bottom of the V-bar flight director. And it should be about 22, 25 degree angle of bank. 22 and a half, I think it is. For a steeper turn. And I'm still maintaining altitude. Go the same the other way. So the G1000 V-bar is really quite good for IFR flying because you can nail your angle of bank simply by looking at the V-bar. You don't have to keep scanning around. It makes it really straightforward. And you've got one angle of bank and another angle of bank. Really straightforward. But you've also got the flight path vector, which makes it much more useful. Easy two zero two Bravo request uh, push and start. Easy two zero two Bravo from stand one five push and start approved point Lima one. Push and start approved to spot Lima one. Easy two zero two Bravo. And audible radar Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike. We're in good VMC conditions. Happy to continue by ourselves. We'll squat conspicuity and speech later. Thanks for the service. Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike. Roger, I see no traffic to affect on your way to Saint Angelo. My service terminates. Squat conspicuity. Frequency change to Unicom one two two decimal eight is approved. Good night. One two decimal eight. You have a good night. Thanks very much. One two two decimal eight. Oh, I can't do it on that one. And you see now I'm hand flying and messing with the radios. Need somebody else to do that for me. Two two decimal eight. Done. And transponder code. He wanted that sorted as well. Can I do this? No, wrong one. Seven thousand. Done. Yeah, I, I can't. You can tune it on the pop up. It's just, um, I can never remember. <laughs> really, I know you can tune it. My brain got confused for a second there. So I reverted to the way that I know. Times of trouble, go with what you know. Excellent. So what do you think of Northern Ireland people? People who haven't been here before. Uh, basic service. <laughs> Now you're asking an interesting question. So that was a basic service delivered by a, a radar unit. So the basic service, they will not officially give you traffic information. Um, but most controllers will anyway. <laughs> so it kind of makes the whole rebranding exercise of the mid-2010s, mid-2000s, uh, to be rather pointless. So it, that was a radar controller we were speaking to. Most of the uh, radar services at low level in the UK were provided by military controllers at military airfields. But the UK Air Force has got four airplanes, so that's not a thing anymore. In the mid-80s, the UK was like an aircraft carrier, but it's just not a thing anymore. And they work Monday to Friday anyway, so if you go flying on the weekends, you don't have any radar service. Yeah, this part of it's fairly flat, Toto. We've got more mountains uh, over in the Republic of Ireland here. And there's a little bit more to the north as well, but fairly flat around about here. Yes, big mountains. We don't have big mountains in the UK. Our biggest mountains, what, 4,500 feet? It's nice to fly the aircraft around for a little bit. It's a, it's a very sweet aircraft to hand fly as long as you don't have the speed up. Toto, you said it gets quite heavy as well at higher speeds. Um, what do the what do the um, the real operators of it do? Do they tend to use the autopilot at higher speeds or, or do they still pull that around? It's a it's a funny dialect, um, sand patch. My wife's from Northern Ireland so you get used to it. But it does seem like sometimes half the words are missed out. So, you know. The the thing I love about Northern Ireland is the people are very friendly. Uh, you know, on, on every community in Northern Ireland, I found them to be very friendly. It's, it's a warm place to visit.
yeah, so that's what I'm doing at the moment, Toto. I'm just just really within the spring tension on the joystick. Do you work on the ships, Sandpatch? I think I think you said previously you you work offshore. Oh, awesome. We work in a similar line of um, similar line of work then. Stavanger, is that Sola? I've not been to Stavanger for quite a few years now. Where have I been? Bergen, go to Bergen quite a bit. Oslo. I've, I've, how many times? I've been to Stavanger a few times, but um, if we if I go to Oslo, I can sometimes go off the airplane and stay there. If I go to Bergen, it would be there and back. Mostly. It's been a long time. We are how far away? Thirteen miles. Four and a half thousand feet. I think it's time to start descending. I'm just going to lower the nose, and I will bring the power off this time. So I'm looking for about a thousand feet a minute. I don't want to get too much faster because I'm in uncontrolled airspace, flying towards a VFR airfield. Beep. Yeah, I know. I should probably set something on there. How about I put one thousand two hundred for the circuit altitude, just as a wee reminder. Scare the wildlife? Oh yes. Yes, it's always cloudy in Northern Ireland. Look at the author. <laughs> so I'm just going to join uh, overhead midfield rather than doing overhead join. You don't really need to see the the UK oddity that's an overhead join. So we'll do a crosswind midfield crosswind join on the downwind left for three two. That's why I've got the um, that's why I've got the headlights on Toto. I won't go into the circuit doing 180 knots. I think that would be quite irresponsible. I do want to be back, uh, bringing the speed back now. So I'm just going to bring the power off to about 10 percent, maybe a bit more. Great thing about the TBM is it slows down really quickly as well. When you want it to slow down, you can really, really slow down. And you get very high limiting speeds on the first stage as well, 178 for the uh, flaps and 178 for the gear. So you've got them very early on in the approach if you need it. So Enniskillen is off to the left there. What I'm trying to do is just manoeuvre so that my pointing arrow is at 90 degrees the runway. And that way I know I'm going to join directly onto crosswind. It's a bit of a cheat. Lights are on. I'll put the tax lights on as well, just to have a, a little bit more brightness. I only did Otho for this this morning. Before I did Otho, there was a lake on the base leg that had the saddest looking sailing boat in it ever because it was a big sailing boat um, and it just was going around in circles doing nothing. I'm going to turn the yaw damper off now. But since the author was generated that lake changed to not be a lake anymore. It was like a proper three-masted sailing boat in a lake that was maybe a quarter of a mile wide. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. Almost like having an aircraft carrier on Lake Garda. Maybe not quite as bad. So I'm going to aim for about 130 knots in this part of it. Keep that alpha under control. I love the alpha indicator. Could save lives if every aircraft had an alpha. It's going to trim it out a little bit as well. Trim it on the rudder.
So what we do in the UK typically is we'd fly over the airfield at 2,000 feet. I should probably call them actually, keep forgetting them online. In it's going traffic, it's Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike TBM 900 inbound from the east entering the traffic pattern midfield crosswind Enniskillen. Right, so the airfield's just a few miles ahead. I've got another 400 feet or so to go. Let's bring the power off. And I'm going to fly it around at Cessna speeds just to show the flexibility of the aircraft. So I'm going to take the first stage of flap. Yeah, it's, it's fairly hard. What was that? Saturation? Sorry, uh, some hatch. Gear's coming down. Oh, AOA? Oh, nonsense. That utter nonsense. I know everybody's got an opinion, but I mean, the AOA saves lives. It, it really is as simple as that. I don't know if Mentor actually flies anything other than a 737. Um, right, coming overhead the airfield, can you see it now? It is just off the nose. And what I'm going to do, we've got the gear down, so I've got gear down, three greens, separators on, and we've got the lights set appropriately. I'm going to be a bit wild and take the final stage of flap now, and that will come back to Cessna speeds, about 190 knots. Here's in a skill. And there used to be another runway. This is the remains of the cross runway when it was a military airfield. And when I came here for real, I was able to do my final turn inside this little church here. But we're not going to do that today. Got it now, Toto. Hope so. In this going traffic, Mike Yankee Tab Tango Bravo Mike is a TBM in the overhead, turning downwind left runway 32 to land. Enniskillen. Top and tail the transmissions so that MD who just picks up the end of it can ask you again if you're on the one frequency. And this is where that magenta thing on the CDI really helps, the magenta bar, because it lets me know when I'm about half mile and one mile crosswind. So it's not cheating, just another way of building your situational awareness. We're at 83 knots. So it's a touch on the slow side for the TBM, but if you have to fit in with GA traffic, you've got the ability with this aircraft to do it. And when you consider that half an hour ago we're up at 280 mixing it with airliners, and now we're down in a certain at an airfield in the middle of nowhere, flying at Cessna speeds, it's pretty amazing. Then when checks, gears down, brakes checked and off. We've got the propeller is fully automatic in this aircraft. And that's all that really matters, we've got more than enough gas. So that lake there, off the, the left um, side there, Toto, that's where the, the saddest little um, sailboat was. It's not there anymore. I need to adjust my views. I didn't get the views quite right on the beta uh, install. But I think if I turn over that lake it'll be fine. Just the power, we'll turn in. And again, always trim it to maintain the speed that you want. Not the longest runway in the world, uh, in a skillin, but it should be enough for us. The FR is hard. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna bang it in, you can land it anywhere, Toto. I like to finesse things. I also like to be in trim, which I'm not at the moment. What have I got done with the rudder here? Oh my bad. A continuous roll. There we go. One red. That's five hundred. Two and two. Speed's good. bad thing. Touch of power, touch more power. I was messing with the trim when I should have been looking out the window. Better. And it 
smoothly with the power looking at the far end of the runway. Down. There we go. Reverse, blow the nose. You see, I was trying to grease it on and we floated. I should have stuck to my guns and just nailed it on. Squeeze the brakes now. And we'll turn on the runway rather than using the horrible taxiway. I need to get a new computer. I just need to I need to wait and make sure that I still have a job in the summer. If I still have a job in the summer, I'll get a new computer. That's my that's my what I'm telling myself. Right, we'll taxi in. I'm gonna leave the taxi lights on, but I'll turn the pulse lights off now. We'll turn the pito heaters and the everything else off. I'll bring the flaps up and I'll reset the trims. Wouldn't normally do this on the runway, but, uh, you know, so be it. Enniskillen traffic, Mike Yankee Tango Bravo Mike is backtracking at runway 32 to parking Enniskillen. Should probably call final as well, but really there's nobody here. So once I've reset the trims, I think the book says when you've reset the trims you can turn the trim and the AP off. It doesn't matter. I thought about that, um, Toto. I'm kind of... I don't know. I mean, mine's, mine's fairly happy with the overclock I've got at the moment. It's running at 4.5... Uh, 4, sorry, 4.3 I think it is. Um, it's it's quite balanced at the moment. I think I'd rather just spend the money and get a new machine. If I was to do anything partially, I'd buy a brand a new computer and move this graphics card into it, and accept that I'd be a little bit GPU limited. Um, because to be honest, I don't mind the visual quality that I've got at the moment. It doesn't annoy me too much. Um, it's just those stutters that annoy me. But if I could get an i7 or something in it, I guess that might be a might be a, an option. It's going to turn the tax light off as we come off the runway. I'll have a look. It's a P68 or something. I need to look in the manual see what it supports. Right, let's just park up. Uh, I don't know. I just got, it goes up to 4.3, I think. 4.3 gigahertz. I don't know what that is on the, the clocks. I've not looked at it in eight years, to be honest. When I got it, it was pre-overclocked with the... You know, when, when I bought it, it was overclocked. And I double-checked the settings to match, make sure they were what I expected, and all was well. Right, I'm going to set the parking brake. Parking brake is set, it bings, I'm going to reset flight idle. And having done that, I'm going to check the lights are off with the exception of the strobe light. We are going to turn off the air conditioning. Come to high idle for a second. Is it? No, I've forgotten. 15 seconds or so at high idle. And then we'll come, well, I'll probably do it. Into low idle. Oh, I have missed it. Here we go. And then off. Yeah, it's right on the limit of what it can do, Toto. It was the fastest um, CPU we could put into the, the board when I got it. So what we're we listening out for here? Oh, we can leave the we can leave the bleed sand patch. I think it's just the um, I think it's just the AC we switch off. So that noise there is the pump running. So we leave it in that state to verify that we do get the boost pump running and then we can switch it off. Then we can also cancel the bing, the prop stopped, strobes off. So across the top here everything is off except the ignition. Set the option off. I'm going to put the separator off. Check the transponder went to standby. Yeah, we'll get that in a second. I, I kind of just top to bottom um, and then I, I wait kind of to make sure everything's done. 
if you do things out of sequence to speed things up, it gets a bit... I forget things, basically. So there's the bing for the door. Oh yeah, oh thank you. You had missed one thing. Toto gets pilot monitoring. Sandpatch gets pilot monitoring for this evening. The fuel selector on the pedestal doesn't need to go off. No, that's... I guess most people just leave it on. That is the separator done, so I'll leave that and we'll just bring the crash bar down. Off, 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 off. Ignition auto, off, off, off. Off, parking brake set. And, you know, we put the chocks in and take the parking brake off so that if the ground crew want to move it, they can do that. And I shall switch this off. And there we are. Mission accomplished in the fantastic TBM 900, which has not got old. Can you believe we've had this thing for, what is it, two and a half years now we've had this aircraft? Doesn't get old. Um, let's have a look at the payload. I'm going to put the static protectors, the static wick, so the wick discharge things, protector covers on, PTO cover on. I'm not going to touch the $50 button. I'm going to put the cap on the engine. And while we're here, let's just have a look at the maintenance. So this is like a 50 hour airframe. There's a lot of GPU stuff. I changed the oil, I refilled the oxygen tank, and that's basically the expenses. Uh, the engine. Engine is in good shape. Everything's looking reasonable. Oil. Uh, I like the fact that the oil goes off when um, you don't use the aircraft for a while. Hey, thanks for the follow, uh, Leading Edge Simulations, and uh, Matt G. Gush as well, much appreciated. Prop Governor, that's a recent thing that's gone to good, but you know, it's not realistic to check this every time. Just curious to see the state of the aircraft's in. Uh, we've got left brakes good, right brakes good, everything else is as new, that's a good start. So, I love the fact that the wear system on this aircraft, I mean, you've got the button here to make it more fun, if you like. But I, I, I find this more fun. I find the fact that aircraft responds and respects that you treat it with a little bit of care. Um, I like that about it. I'm curious now what I did to the prop um, governor to get it from as new to good. Maybe that was, um, maybe I oversped it at some point. Maybe it's just wear. Maybe it's just lifetime wear. No dramas. Anyway, shall we do a little flight over to, how long has the stream been going? What time is it? Yeah, I think we've got time, half an hour, for a flight over towards um, Sligo. If anybody else wants to join, I'll leave it on, on Vatsim. We can do a little little group trip across there. Let me just uh, change over to the TBM. Uh, one second, if I put this to that. 